Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to learn more about our gopher tortoise friends and how we can help protect them. So bear with me while I figure out the, the PowerPoint buttons. I tried to practice before, but there we go. Wait. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, don't want you to get confused, all right? Real gopher, rodent, lives underground. Gopher tortoise, reptile, also lives underground, okay? Two different things, but you will hear me and uh, some of my colleagues throughout this presentation, of course, calling gopher tortoises simply tortoise, uh, gophers, and GTs for short. So just be aware, right? We're going to have a lot of vocabulary words here today. Um, let's first talk about some of the differences, okay? Turtle and a tortoise. Anybody out there just want to throw out one difference that you might see between the um, turtle on the left and the tortoise on the right? Be brave. Can, yes. <laughs> yes. And you would not believe how many people every year get really confused and put tortoises in water. So good observation. Yes. All tortoises are turtles, not all the other way around. All turtles include a subset of tortoises. Yeah, you're right. That's that's in here too. <laughs> so all turtles or all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises, okay? So some other differences you'll notice, big flippers, right, meant for swimming. More claw-like limbs that are meant for climbing around on the land and digging holes. Um, their shells, turtle shells are a lot flatter, you know, so they're going to be easier for swimming. These guys, it's more like a plate of armor, you know, they're gonna be a little bit thicker. So here's a little breakdown. Tortoises are herbivores, so they mainly eat plants. Turtles eat meat and vegetation. Tortoises live on land, turtles near the water or in the water, and they typically spend a fair amount of time in the water. Tortoises have clawed feet, turtles have webbed feet, tortoises thrive in a hot environment. Turtles are more adaptable, they can live in cooler environments, although not Sweden. Um, tortoises thrive in a dry environment, turtles can handle more humidity, they have thinner shells, and tortoises have thicker shells. So the reason that we go into this too, and, and we'll get into it later when you're trying to help a tortoise, is again, please, they, don't, they can't thrive in the water. And a lot of people don't know that. They just see an animal that looks like a turtle and they think they're all the same, right? So trying to keep that differentiation. Um, you might, see a tortoise on the beach. So this just aids in the confusion, right? Why am I seeing tortoises on the beach if they don't live near water? Well, for years and years and decades, they have found that the dune areas are decent habitat. Um, you'll also sometimes see them at the boardwalks, you know, in the grassy spot by the bathrooms, you know, when you're walking to the, I think of the Sebastian Inlet, you'll always see one there. So just because they live there, we still don't want to put them in the water. I know you're, you'll hear me say it multiple times. <laughs> Tell a friend. Um, the only native North American tortoise species east of the Mississippi, okay? So their range is Southern South Carolina, Southern Georgia, and into Florida, but they also range into Southern Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, but they are nearly extinct in South Carolina and Louisiana, and they're pretty rare in Mississippi and Alabama. So I will say I lived in Georgia for a very long time. Granted, it was more northern Georgia, I never saw a tortoise. But in Florida, we see them all the time. So I don't know this to be completely true, but I'm pretty sure most of their population is in Florida at this point. And they do occur in all of our counties in Florida. Gopher tortoises are among the oldest living species on the planet, arising about 60 million years ago. Their family tree dates back 250 million years. And obviously there's been a lot of things that have evolved over time. So way back when, the earliest versions of turtles had um, teeth, which would be kind of scary. Um, and they didn't all have shells way back then, but as they've evolved and they've kind of, you know, fit into their niche, these things have gone away. So uh, turtles and tortoises don't have teeth now, which is really good when you're worried about picking one up out of the road. <laughs> okay, although the beaks can hurt. And I can say from parrot experience, beaks hurt. Um, so their fact sheet here, um, the scientific name is Gopherus polyphemus. Their conservation status is threatened to endangered. Here it's threatened, 
Um, and you know, those things are subject to change, but we're gonna talk about why they're particularly vulnerable and it's really important that we keep their status um, threatened if not endangered because quickly it could go that direction. They are about nine to 11 inches as adults and about 10 pounds. Their lifespan in the wild is 40 to 60 years. And in captivity, um, the oldest known gopher tortoise in captivity is 100 years old. His name is Gus. He lives at a museum in Canada, but he was born in Florida or hatched, I should say. All right, let's talk about some anatomy here. The gopher tortoise shell. So the upper shell is called the carapace. This is vocab word time. The way that I remember that is the shell is shaped like a curve. If you turn that curve sideways, it makes a C and C for carapace. All right. So if you're ever at a trivia night, this is gonna this might come in handy and, and win you 50 bucks. I don't know. Um, the bottom shell is called the plastron, and I remember that by thinking they're plastered to the ground. So it's flat, flat to the ground. Um, the shell is an outgrowth of their skeleton. So I don't know, I saw cartoons as a kid where like a, a turtle would like take their shell off and go to bed. That doesn't, that's not possible, okay? Uh, it doesn't work that way. So if their shell gets injured, I mean, that is a, could be a life-threatening problem for them. Um, so can they feel through the shell? Yes, the shell has nerve endings. They can feel touch, heat, cold, and vibrations. So I think part of why when they get stuck in the road and they feel the vibration of the car coming, they clam up because they assume it's a predator or something, they feel that vibration. And then if they keep cars keep coming, they're not going to re-extend themselves and go. So that's why they get stuck. Do gopher tortoises bite? So I can say I have seen them bite each other, which is interesting. Usually when being aggressive, like if they're fighting, I saw one actually nip the other one's shell, like the edge of its shell but they don't bite people for some reason. Um, and I can say that I, I assisted with a professional relocation and the relocator has to get these tortoises and they're not very happy. I mean, they're kind of stressed and they're not wanting to be held, let's say. Um, and he put his hand in front of its face to kind of, cause he was measuring it with a measuring tape. So he's trying to get it to like stay still. And I was thinking to myself, if this animal had any ounce of aggression, <laughs> it would last right onto his finger. <laughs> but they never do. The worst thing you might experience is they hiss at you. So if you are going to get one out of the road and you hear, Shh, um, it's just upset, you know, just go ahead and pick it up anyway, despite what it's telling you, it's not gonna bite you. Now, if we're talking snapping turtles, that's a different story. That's a different slide that's not in here. But if anyone needs a trick for getting those out of the road, I have a couple a that I, <laughs> yep, that's one of my shovel, yep. <laughs> so get creative, watch your fingers. Okay, so they have large elephantine hind limbs and flat shovel-like forelimbs that they use to dig. Their burrows can be up to 40 feet long and 10 feet deep, um, even 15 feet deep. So, you know, this is one of those things where we don't have as much data as we'd like. So a little bit of it is a, a best guess, but um, they go, you know, down and then out. And it just kind of depends on what that tortoise is feeling like today and what they think is gonna be best for that environment. The burrows are the perfect temperature year round. So um, they spend about 80% of their time in the burrow. And this time of year is going into like their downtime. So you won't see them be as active from now until about spring. They kind of, you know, they might spend more time in their burrow and they just chill out a little bit. It's not like a full hibernation, but it's similar in that, you know, there's certain seasons where they just tend to stay underground. Um, the burrows help shelter them from bad weather, fires, um, and predators. And here's a side view. Um, most tortoises have more than one burrow. So usually if we're doing like a burrow survey and we you know, count 60 burrows on a property, we're gonna assume that there's at least maybe, thir maybe 30 tortoises. Um, you would still check each one, but you know, we're generally thinking about two per tortoise, okay? Um, the burrow itself is this awesome work of engineering. It is so sturdy that like horses can walk across the top of them and it's not going to collapse. Um, if you look at a burrow, it's the shape of the tortoise that made it. So about this, you can assume the size of the tortoise that made the burrow is reflective of what you're seeing. And 
like when when we're, we're I'll show later kind of digging some of these burrows, they hold their shape and they're very dense. Um, when they go all the way down here, if you look in the bottom left, there's a chamber at the bottom. So the whole burrow is typically only the width of the tortoise going one way. When they get to the bottom, they can turn around in the chamber and then come back up. And the other neat thing is this chamber is typically right above the water table. So they have this instinctive drive and they know where that is because it keeps the humidity perfect in their burrow, which is important for reptiles. Um, and it's nice and cool. So that's the gist of their burrows. Over the little side chambers that you might see, those are created typically by other animals. And that's what we're gonna get into here. So you'll hear gopher tortoise is called a keystone species. And that's because they are like the foundation of this pyramid where so many other animals depend on them for survival. So if they're taken out of the environment, it causes a collapse in a couple of different, well, several different areas. Um, they play a good role in seed dispersal because they eat a lot of plants. And then you know what happens? They spread the seeds around. Um, they help with soil aeration. And their absence would cause a big imbalance in the food chain because of the 350 other species that depend on them. And we're gonna talk a little bit about who else uses the burrow, okay? So what kind of critters you might see down there? So the gopher frog, this one, here's another vocab word, obligate commensal. This means, no, right, jot that down, just kidding. Um, that means that they actually rely on the burrow to survive because they can't dig their own. So without a burrow to live in, they are toast, okay? Um, it's very important for them that gopher tortoises are around. Any bird people in the room? Me, yeah. So um, burrowing owls, which I have yet to see live in person yet, but I will um, on a birding journey at some point. Um, they sometimes can use gopher tortoise burrows. Now they are capable of digging their own, but they will take advantage of, uh, like most owls, they'll take advantage of another nesting site or another burrow that they don't have to uh, dig. But they are becoming more and more rare as well. Other critters, um, insects, reptiles, and mammals. So we've got our indigo snake, our gopher cricket, and the Florida mouse. And you can see why, you know, and it's hard sometimes because a lot of people really just aren't gonna get excited about gopher crickets. Like, oh, I need more of those in my yard, right? But again, when you think about the big picture, these are all animals that get eaten by other animals. So it rocks the foundation of the food chain if you take them out, right? And it might be also why the snakes like to hang out in the burrows. It's an easy meal, okay? Um, all right, so we gotta talk about this and I don't get, don't get too worried, okay? Um, very occasionally rattlesnakes will share a burrow. Um, typically, it's going to be in cold weather, and it's very rare. So before everyone starts going, oh my gosh, I can't have a burrow in my yard, which you guys probably wouldn't say that um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. One of my colleagues, Mark, who does professional relocation, he's an ecological consultant. He's dug about six to 800 burrows in his career, and he said he's only found two rattlesnakes ever in any of those burrows. And it was on the same piece of property in North Florida. So like that piece of property, do not go sticking your hand in the burrow. Which really, who's sticking their hand in a hole in the ground anyway? It's just a bad idea, right? But don't get too worried about this, but it is an interesting little fact that they can sometimes be in there. So be aware. Um, okay, let's talk about diet. So 70 to 80% of their diet is grass. Sounds pretty boring, but they like all kinds of grass. They generally feed within 160 feet of their burrow. And one really cool thing about them is it's been noted that if a tortoise is like feeling a little under the weather or maybe just has something going on and they, they feel different, you know, they might have an ailment of some kind, they will actually go really far to find a specific plant that will help in whatever's going on. So I think about like digestion, parasites, things like that, that they might be able to feel their tummies a little off. They can actually go seek that out. And that's all instinct. Um, you'll see when we get to reproduction, the parents don't do anything with the, with the babies. Like they hatch and they're on their own. So this is just, it's so cool what can be passed down in genetics. Grasses of all kinds, here's one munching. Can, can you get enough of the pink tongue? It's the cutest thing, I swear. Um, 
Okay, Biden's Alba or Beggar's Ticks. And I'm just gonna whip through these, but if you guys are interested in possibly planting native plants in your yard that would help tortoises, you could always snap a, a picture of these slides or um, just jot it down. Prickly pear, they love cactus and they eat all parts of the cactus. Blackberries, so they don't mind spiky things. Uh, dwarf huckleberry. Nettles, which, oh, those singing nettles are the worst. So again, yet another service they provide for us, right? <laughs> Asters of all kinds and colors. And the invasive Florida snow. So I'm sure you guys get this in your lawn. Pretty much everybody does. It grows where nothing else does. So we might as well use it. And the little, I have seen little baby tortoises munching on these flowers. It's so cute. And like the flowers like almost as big as their head and they just, you know, they just mow them right down. So that's one of their favorites. Oh, sorry, I didn't warn y'all. Okay. Um, we're all adults here. Um, okay, so reproduction, right? How do these guys get it together and reproduce? Um, typically males are traveling farther to find females and they might compete. Um, they are territorial, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they do get in fights over this kind of stuff. Um, you will see, and I've had the pleasure of seeing this a couple times, getting, you know, it's like Discovery Channel, um, where they're bobbing their heads. So they do this little head bob at each other, and they'll do this in a courtship ritual, but it's also a precursor to aggression. So it's one of those things, you know, like she kind of has to decide if she is ready for this or not. Um, some of the females will, a lot of them will actually mate with several males. And what's interesting is in the clutch of eggs, some of those eggs might have different genetic material because they might have different dads. Um, so there have been some studies showing that a lot of the females do end up having like a favorite male that they kind of have a, retain a relationship with over the period of years, which is pretty cool. So they do have like a social structure. We just haven't done enough like studies just sitting there watching them, which I would love to do. Someone give me a grant for that. <laughs> um, boys and versus girls. So first of all, you can't really tell until they're at least about 10 years old. But the males have a concave shell, which is over on the right side of the screen. And the females have a flat plastron. Remember the word plastron. So um, it makes sense when you think about them fitting together, right? Kind of common sense here. But it's interesting that they have developed their anatomy to make that all happen. Um, nesting season is typically from late April to mid July. The clutches have about five to nine eggs. That's like nothing, right? Okay. So you're going to start to see why they're so vulnerable here. Um, females can actually store eggs over a few months if they want to wait for a better time to lay them, which is pretty cool. Um, hatchlings emerge from late August to early November. And so you want to look out for that. And as you can imagine, they're very slow to reproduce. They don't hit sexual maturity until at least 10 years old. Um, so when you see like a big old tortoise taken out like on the road, it's heartbreaking because you're like that, that creature could have been 40 years old and actually a reproducing important, you know, not that they wouldn't be important otherwise, but they're keeping the population going. So this is a tortoise covering her eggs. So when you look at a tortoise burrow, the big dirt patch right out the front is called the apron. And that's usually where she buries her eggs. It's, they don't go deep either. It's not like sea turtles where they're really getting down there. So if you walk across the apron, you could crush eggs under your feet. It also leaves it kind of susceptible to raccoons, you know, and critters that are going around. So just more reasons that it's like, all right, guys, you know, there's just, they're not really, um, not many of them make it to maturity. The eggs are thin and brittle. They look like little ping pong balls. Um, I just get, I just never gets old for me. Uh, the sex of the clutch depends on the temperature. So 85 degrees and up, you're gonna produce most likely females in the clutch and cooler than that is males. And it's similar to alligators. If you guys are into that kind of biology stuff, um, their egg, egg situation is similar. Okay, here's the crushing statistics. We had to put the cute picture by the sad statistics. Only 25% of eggs hatch and only 10% of those survive the first year. Give me my gopher tortoise nursery. I'm just, I, you know, sometimes you'll see places like Florida Wildlife Hospital 
um, they have like a little incubator so then they can hatch them and make sure they get a little bigger before they release, which I think is such a cool idea. Here's another one. Um, they are brighter in color and they're easy to miss. So when it's like that net, um, hatching time, be careful when you're out on your trails. I had the horrifying experience of walking and like my foot is like this and I was watching where I was going because I'm always looking for fire ants. And lo and behold, there was the tiniest little tortoise that must've just hatched and it was orange, like orange spots on it. It camouflaged in perfectly. So they're easy to miss. Um, keep your eyes peeled. Okay, the main threat to gopher tortoises, not a surprise, is habitat loss, right? We are building at record speeds and they just can't keep up. Um, at one time, longleaf pine forests covered 90 million unbroken acres from Virginia to Florida and west to Texas. This is pine flatlands, usually dominated by slash pine or longleaf pine. Um, tortoises prefer to not have a bunch of ground cover. And as you can see here, this is grass, which they would eat, and there is some dirt in between. Um, so think about like scrub jay habitat is also generally very good um, gopher tortoise habitat. Less than 5% of this habitat remains. And it's also really desirable for people, right? Because it's not the swamp, it's not wet, it's you know where we can build houses. So development, agricultural conversion, and fire suppression have actually hurt the gopher tortoise habitat. Fires are actually good for the habitat because it helps burn off that um, undergrowth and starts to grow over, and that helps the tortoises be able to more successfully live there. How much space do they need? So here, the average, ma uh, the male, average male tortoise has about a 4.7 acre range, and females are a little less at about 1.6 acres. However, if they have really high quality food available, they don't need as much space. They do have territorial disputes. So in areas that have become really densely populated um, from tortoises, they, um, they will get in fights, and the males especially. So they try to flip each other over. It's pretty brutal. So they want the, the male that flips the other male over then we'll sometimes stand by and make sure that one can't flip himself back over for an extended period of time until he is completely exhausted, exhausted and possibly actually perishes. So nature is brutal, but um, if you see a tortoise flipped over, let's just help him out, just flip him back over. <laughs> they can't really right themselves, but these are the kinds of things that can happen when we, you know, if we're trying to make sure, oh, let's just put all of the tortoises on this conservation land. Well, that land quickly gets overpopulated and that's not good for them either, right? So let's talk about homing instinct. Um, you might have heard of this with pigeons. You know, they kind of know where their home is. Um, if a tortoise is moved from their home, they will try to get back no matter the distance. So I have spoken to well-meaning people who love animals that maybe had a tortoise that they weren't sure it was like digging under their foundation and they were worried about that. So they just thought enough, they looked it up and got the tortoise and moved it um, like 10 miles away to a conservation area and thought that was fine, right? We win-win, okay? The problem is it's probably a death sentence because the tortoise is going to try to get back to their home. They get confused, they get exhausted, they cross multiple roads, which puts them in danger. And so ultimately it's just not a good situation. Um, again, people just don't know. So that's why we're doing this. You know, It seems harmless enough, but it, it does cause harm. Relocation is a legitimate option if you really do need to move a gopher tortoise on your property, but it needs to be done through the appropriate channels. And there's reasons for that. So um, what you're seeing here is um, a couple of professional ecological consultants came through this property and flagged. So over on the far right, you'll see the little orange ribbons. They flagged where the burrows were, and then they came back. They will try to put a bucket trap outside the door of the burrow, and they cover it, and it's literally like a cartoon. The tortoise just falls in the bucket. And that is a little bit less stressful, as, though it sounds kind of mean, than digging them out of their burrow. But if they can't catch it that way in a couple of days, um, they will dig up the burrow. And you see the backhoe in the picture on the left? This is a huge operation. He's 10 feet down <laughs> from where the ground started. And they use this little pipe to put in there so they can kind of follow the burrow down. And these guys do an exceptional job. They really, really care about this, what they're doing. 
Can't say the same for everyone. You know, they, there's no rule. I mean, there are some rules, but it's very loose with how these relocations are done. As long as you are in the proper channels and you're, you know, an equal, you're licensed by FWC. So um, they get the tortoise out, and then they got to measure them and weigh them. And then in this case, this was an on-site relocation. So this property owner had tortoises on his property and he was going to build a little road entryway into the property. So they needed to get the tortoises from that section and actually temporarily move them to another section so that they could fence off the construction zone and then release the tortoises back. So this is a good situation, right? The tortoises actually got to stay on their home. They just got booted out of their, they just have to dig a new burrow, right? So that's this little pen here. Um, they hung out in that pen for like a week or so. And then once the construction fence was built, they were released. They're also marked. So on the far right side, um, it's really hard to see, but there's the tiniest little triangle that was filed into the um, shell. This isn't painful for the tortoise, but it just allows the um, FWC and the, and the relocators to keep track of them. So this is what I was saying. Um, she didn't even bite him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's, they're just docile creatures. Um, okay, so the other option that you may have heard of is offsite relocation. So this is um, when big developers come in and they buy a property and they're gonna build, they have to go through this channel because there's just no room to keep the tortoise. Now, um, some would argue that if we started building our houses a little differently and left more space on the lot, you could actually do it on site and keep the tortoise. So just keep that in mind if you're ever building a house. Um, but most developers just want a cookie cutter, you know, as they build. So they're going to get the tortoises are going to get relocated to a recipient site. A recipient site is somebody who um, has put up their property. It's usually 25 acres or more. Sometimes there's cows and agriculture going on, and they have to actually pay every year to maintain the property so that it's suitable habitat. So the tortoise will spend some time in a Rubbermaid bin, <laughs> and. Um, while they, whoever is relocating them contacts a recipient site, drives them to the recipient site. And then, so remember the homing instinct? They have to spend six months in a silt fence pen to break that homing instinct so that they will finally accept that recipient site as their new home, right? So it's a big deal and it's stressful. These guys don't eat very well when they're in, you know, at least the ones with, that we did, they weren't really interested in eating. They were just like trying, like, I'm going to get out of this pen, right? So it's something to think about. It's also very expensive. It's somewhere between $5,500 and $6,500 to relocate a tortoise, which is hard for people to do. And you can see why some people choose a, you know, an inappropriate route because they just don't know any better. But um, it's good to know the on-site option because let's say you want to build a shed or something on your existing property, but there's a tortoise, you can go through FWC to take a little course. It's a lot less expensive or get someone like Mark, a consultant, to come help you actually just move it from there, but keep it on your property. And I didn't know that was even an option until a couple years ago when I went through a, a training on this. So, all righty, the roads. Okay, the next thing. Um, Roads tend to fragment go for tortoise uh, habitat. I'm sure you guys, if you you know pay attention, there might be a tortoise in your neighborhood that you know you're driving to work and it's on one side of the road, and every afternoon it's on the other side of the road. You know they cross the street to eat the good grass over here and go right back. So um, if you see a tortoise in the road, what do you do? Okay. Um, first of all, use common sense. Don't just dead stop right <laughs> and get out. Um, I will usually put my flashers on, pull over. The scary thing is sometimes people whip around you, but you know, you just got to be sensible. Um, you can get out and I usually like wave, you know what I mean? To try to flag people down and go over. And when you pick them up, you're going to put a hand on each side of their shell. So the head end and the you know tail end facing, facing them away from you and walk them in the direction they were going. They might kick a little bit, you know, and swim in the air, but that's about it. Um, if you try to put them on the other side, because you think that's a better <laughs> space for them to be, you're going to be looking in your rear view as that little sucker turns around and starts crossing again. So put them in the direction they were going. If you see one sometimes walking along a curb because they can't get up on the curb, um, I usually just put them up in the grass and they figure it out. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of you have been through this before. What if it's hurt? 
This is a picture from Florida Wildlife Hospital of a little bandaged up tortoise with his little crack shell. Um, they can do really amazing shell repairs. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. So if you see blood, even if it doesn't look like fresh, you know, but if you can still tell it's blood, then it's pretty fresh. Um, or if you see cracked shell, or sometimes I've seen them where it looks like half the shell is literally collapsed and the other half is whole, there's a decent chance it's still alive. Um, they have very slow metabolisms, so do any turtles, and it sometimes takes them days to pass away completely. So this is why I started the tortoise team of Indian River County, because I would be driving to a training session and I'd see one just freshly hit and I got to stop, get it and take it to our humane society, which we'll kind of talk about here soon. Um, sometimes you're going to a doctor's appointment or something and you literally can't stop. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a place that you could go ask for help from other people who care? So that's what the tortoise team does is if you see one and you can't stop, you can go put the cross streets in our Facebook group and one of our, somebody will make a point to go get it. Um, it's a pretty neat network. We have like almost 700 people in there that really care, which is so awesome, right? Um, if it's cracked, what do you do? So I advise that you keep a car kit. Um, it could be an Amazon box or a bin, like a Rubbermaid bin. Uh, a trash can liner, a contractor bag, gloves if you like, um, and then a towel or like a potty pad from puppy, you know, like puppy pads. Um, those are pretty easy because you can just throw it away then, rather than the towel. If it's an injured tortoise, it is kind of hard to stomach, so I'll warn you, but you're their hope, right? Nobody's going to stop <laughs> except you um, or maybe me if I drive by the same way. Um, so put the potty pad or the towel over the whole animal and then just kind of scoop them up gently and place them in the box and then take them to, for the fastest care, one of these facilities. Those of you that live in Brevard County, Florida Wildlife Hospital is an amazing organization. They're right off the of US one, just north of here. And um, they have drop boxes all night long. So you can just put it in the drop box and go and they'll take care of it. If you're in further south, like Vero, um, down in Fort Pierce, we have Creature Safe Place that can help. And both of those, for me and Sebastian, are a 45-minute drive. So if you can't get to either of these locations, you can take it to the Vero Beach Humane Society, and they will triage. And they have volunteers, like a list of volunteers they'll call to drive wild animals up to Florida Wildlife Hospital. Um, and the thing is, a lot of times these guys are beyond repair but you're sparing them from a really agonizing death by ants on the side of the road, okay? It's sad, it's heartbreaking, but you're helping them out. And even if they end up, you know, they can't do anything, it's at least gonna put them at peace, right? It's tough stuff. Okay, how else can you guys help? So um, if you see, you guys probably know your neighborhood pretty well. If you know there's a vacant lot across the street and all of a sudden you see them pull up with some big heavy machinery because they're gonna start clearing, you can call your own county or go on the FWC website and see if they pulled a permit for that property. Um, if you know there's a gopher tortoise on it, definitely, definitely check because they need to have addressed that. And we have had many people that have caught and stopped construction on a property because they didn't do it right. They did not, you know, they were trying to sneak by and not notice the gopher tortoise, right? So we are their eyes and ears. Um, you can also report known burrows or injured deceased tortoises on the FWC website, okay? Take a picture of this slide if you guys want to so that you have that e address. You can also Google it and it'll come up. But if FWC doesn't have any data on how many injured tortoises we're pulling off the road every year, they have very little motivation to do anything about it or give any money towards that or anything, right? Data is power. As annoying as it is to like take the extra five minutes to go do that when you're you know, in a rush, it really does help keep some statistics that will help us later. Um, known burrows as well, if you have a, a couple in your area that you know of, if you put that on the map, that's further evidence later if somebody tries to pull a permit on that property that they can cross-reference and go, hey, there was a burrow reported here, right? Is it still here? Also helping them get out of the road in the direction they were going and keeping your dogs away from tortoises. Um, you know, accidents happen, but if your dog gets a hold of a tortoise and like you see any blood or a scratch or anything, do the right thing and take it to the wildlife hospital just in case. Um, you know, don't just let it go and assume it'll be fine. Uh, it might be fine and they might say, take it back, but at least you got it checked out, right? 
Okay, a couple other ways. Fight to keep urban sprawl away from gopher tortoise habitat. So this is paying attention to your city council meetings, paying attention to what's going on in your area. You know, are they planning to build a huge hotel on the riverfront in Sebastian? Yes, they are. So, you know, these kinds of things that's easy to miss when you're busy and you're in your day to day, but we do have the power to kind of say something about it, you know? Um, promoting sensible controlled burning. So some people freak out about controlled burns, like it's bad for you know the environment, but it's actually good if it's done right. Um, planting gopher friendly native plants and grasses. Um, FWC actually has a designation. You can be a gopher tortoise friendly yard and get a cute little sign. Um, so you can check that out if you want, or you can just plant some of those native plants we talked about and it might draw them to you. Don't mow, dig, drive over, or disturb the area around the burrow. Again, there might be eggs there, right? Um, and then educate others about these amazing creatures. So this is like, for me, one of the number ones, aside from getting them out of the road, because that's like a real time, you fix the problem. Um, I have had conversations with people just because I'm excited about this topic. And I've talked to people who moved down to Florida and literally it did not even cross their mind to get to stop and get this tor turtle out of the road. Sometimes they don't even recognize it. Their brain doesn't even recognize it as a turtle. They think rock, coconut, you know? And because if you think about it, if you live up in some uh, other state that doesn't have as much wildlife as us, you rarely see a turtle in the road. It's just not even on your radar, okay? So sometimes it's not even intentional. That's what I'm getting at is people just don't think about it. So when I've told people this, um, I've had like, you know, colleagues, clients come back to me later, texting me pictures of like, oh, look, I got this turtle out of the road on my bike ride, you know? So they just don't know. And if you share that information, um, it will make a change. It, it, just a little ripple effect, you know? <clears throat> oh, and this down here. So if you suspect illegal activity, you know, it's illegal to possess or move or mess with any gopher tortoises, you can always call FWC. There's an anonymous line. Okay, other couple things. Um, this QR code, if you take a photo of this slide, um, you know, you put your camera on here and it's gonna pop up a link for you. That will take you to our Facebook page. We don't yet have a full-blown website, but we do put a lot of information. You know, we're building our Facebook page so that people can find us. And um, you could message us through there if you had any questions. Um, volunteering or donating. So I do have a possible volunteer opportunity coming up. It's gonna be in Indian River County, but the county's working with us to have trained volunteers to go help survey some uh, of their prop, the county's property before they do some land maintenance and stuff to make sure the boroughs are safe. So um, I will have an opportunity for that coming up and we will be training people on how to survey. If you like field work, at this time of year, it's nice. In the summer, it's pretty brutal. Like you're out there with machetes and it's hot and you have to sit down every hour and drink some Gatorade. But um, if you're interested in that, uh, I have a sign up sheet at the back. If those of you that are on Zoom, um, you could just email uh, or go here and message us through the um, through the Facebook page. Um, okay, we also have stickers back there that are um, donation five dollars. They are I break for tortoises. You can put them right on your car. So when you do pull over and put your flashers on, people might have an idea of what you're doing. Um, and we have t-shirts. So the shirt that I'm wearing says go for it. Um, we have a little link where you can order your size, just individual to your house. So um, that is in the back as well. Okay. All right. Join the tortoise team of Indian River County. I know you guys are in Brevard, but we do have, you know, some people right at that southern end of Brevard that help us out and are on our list. So this QR code will take you to that Facebook group. If you don't have Facebook, I'm sorry, this is just the easiest way for us to do this right now. You can create a fake account if you were really committed. Um, but this is how we communicate when we find injured ones, getting them out of the road, and also you know other volunteer um, events and things like that. Okay, that is about everything. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to get started with some questions. So I'm going to come around the room and go ahead and pick up those cards from you guys. Um, we'll get started with the first question 
Um, you showed a lot of cute pictures of gopher tortoises. Can you please speak to what someone um, might encounter if they wanted to have a gopher tortoise as a pet? Oh, good question. They are adorable. So um, gopher tortoises, as cute as they are, especially knowing the statistics about hatchlings, I can totally understand the desire to just take one home, right? It's going to have a safer life with you. But these are wild animals and it's really important that they get a chance to live their fullest life. It's not only is it just straight up illegal to have them, um, but most of the time when you see tortoises in captivity, their shells get malformed um, because the diet that we provide them is just subpar. Um, and it's just, it's, it's really not, these are wild animals. They want their freedom. As you can see, they have opinions, right? Like you try to take it away from its home and it's gonna be miserable trying to get back. So um, they're not really appropriate as pets. And when it comes to, cause people do keep other kinds of tortoises as pets, um, do your research because especially in Florida, we know you can just go get an exotic reptile at like a flea market. <laughs> um, but a lot of times they end up released into the environment or we just don't really know how to care for them properly. And it's like a hundred year commitment. Okay. I thought parrots had a long life. Um, turtles and tortoises or tortoises live a very long time. So, um, you know, it's a commitment and you can't just plan on you, know, you got to have a plan, whether it's a, you know, especially if it's a pet tortoise, not a gopher tortoise. So I hope that helped. Sorry, it's a bummer. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Here's our next question. This says, I live next to Wickham Park. Uh, when I find a gopher tortoise in my neighborhood, I return it to the park. Is this the correct thing to do? Good question. Um, I'm going to say no. Um, I know you're trying to do the right thing, but the best situation is to just put it out of harm's way in the direction it was going. Because most likely, again, you're fighting nature. So if that wasn't where it was going right now, you just doubled its time because now it's got to double back and go to wherever it was going. So um, just moving them as minimal as you can out of harm's way, that's all you want to do. Because otherwise you're just messing with their whole little game plan. And like I said, they, they know where they're going. <laughs> so, uh, and they don't like to be interrupted. Awesome. All righty, our next question here. Um, they love hot weather and seems like they would, oh, what does this say? I'm gonna bring this back to who wrote it. <laughs> oh, it seems like they would need to drink a lot of water. I hear they don't drink at all, just surviving from the moisture in their food. That is pretty accurate, yes. So the majority of their um, water intake is coming from the grasses and stuff that they eat constantly. And they're like little elephants. I mean, they eat all, you know, very often throughout the day. So that's how they get their moisture. I will say one thing that I thought was really neat with the relocator I was working with is that when they were gonna be in the silt fence pen and he knew that they weren't gonna be eating very well, he would make a point to actually do uh, a little soak, you know, put them in a bin with some water to kind of, um, that helps hydrate them so that they stay nice and hydrated. That's not something that relocators have to do, but it seems like the ones that really care about the welfare and keeping them going, you know, they do things like that. Um, but that's like a very extenuating circumstance and a tortoise wouldn't normally put themselves in that situation, right? And it, it's it's us doing that to keep them going. Yeah. Do gopher tortoises come out of their home every day, early morning, late afternoon, when they feel like it? Yeah, good question. Um, I typically see them like late morning. That's just my anecdotal. Uh, I think that the, the temperature matters. You know, I think on these cooler mornings, they probably wait a little longer to come out. And then, as I said, at this time of year, you'll start seeing them stay in a little more often but I don't know the exact timing. I would imagine it's kind of regional too and based on temperature. All right, uh, do they live solo in their burrow or is it a family fair in the burrow, mom, dad, et cetera? Good question. Typically it's one tortoise per burrow, although we do occasionally see them sharing. Um, we might see like a younger juvenile in there with an adult, but there's no like maternal fuzziness going on. Um, they don't, you know, once eggs, once she lays those eggs and they hatch, that's it. She's out. So, um, they aren't getting like guidance or protection from one another. Um, but you know, they might pop into each other's burrow. And again, if the one that is 
deeper in the burrow or the bigger tortoise, if they don't want that, they can push them right out. So, you know, you might see them cohabitating on occasion. Is there a source for gopher tortoise crossing signs? Yes. Okay. So we have put in a request um, with the county to get some gopher tortoise signs. So one neat thing, remember I was talking about data and how important. So our tortoise team of Indian River County Group has been a data pocket that I didn't realize. Um, I went back through every post where people said, I see one hit at this street and this street. I see one at this street and this street. And I put it all together to figure out where are the hot spots where they're getting hit most in our county. And I, we asked, the Gopher Tortoise Alliance asked um, the, one of the county reps to hopefully get some gopher tortoise signs in those key areas. And we did uh, get approval for that, but it is very slow going. So we haven't actually seen it come to fruition. What you can do is print out like a gopher tortoise sign, or, you know, if you want to pay for one, you can order them on, uh, online and stick it in your yard. If you know that there's one that crosses back and forth, I've been driving through like neighborhoods, especially Vero Lake estates. And there are some people who will just have a little gopher tortoise crossing sign in front of the vacant lot next to their house. So you can do that. Um, and it helps. I mean, at least people see something, right? Yeah. Do gopher tortoises like gopher apple? They do. Yes. That is another one of the plants. Um, one of our board members, she wrote up like a very long list of all the plants that they eat. And I'm sure I can get that. If anybody's interested, um, let me know and we can get that to you. Um, but yeah, that is on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, how long is the generation period? Uh, and is it longer if the mother chooses to carry the eggs in her for a longer time? Ooh, the gestation period. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you got me on that one. So um, I don't know the exact biology of that, but it's something I could look up and get back to you if you are interested uh, and email me or something or message through the group. All right, well, that's all the questions that we have here. Thank you again so much, Jeriana, and thank you everybody for attending today. Awesome. Yay.